ready to, to start the 15 minutes tolerance yet point, it's <laughs> over. <laughs> Boa, tarde. Boa tarde. Good evening. Viva Dia Internacional de Língua Materno. My name is Carlos Almeida. I am professor of Portuguese, the director of the Luso Centro and coordinator of the Portuguese English Community Interpreting Certificate here at Bristol. At this time, I would like to invite Dr. Laura Douglas, president of Bristol Community College, to welcome you to Bristol. Dr. Douglas. Well, thank you, Professor Almeida. It's so wonderful to see so many people here today. You know, this morning when I woke up, I heard the news that it was International Pancake Day <laughs> in order of Mardi Gras, but nobody made reference to International Day of Mother Language, right? Which is so important to this country, right? How many of us grew up in households where our relatives spoke another language in addition to English. Yeah, so true. And uh, you know, it, every generation seems to be a little bit more removed uh, from this, but it is still so much a part of our American tradition uh, that each of us can celebrate uh, our mother language, our mother tongue, and uh, the cultures uh, that we are connected to, whether they are here in the United States or somewhere maybe a little bit farther away. It's always wonderful to attend an event uh, put on by our Luso Centro. Uh, our Luso Centro is so critical to Bristol Community College because we have so many students and faculty and staff who, uh, who come from Cape Verde. And uh, our interpreting program is so important. Uh, we want to make sure that our students are learning to uh, uh, interpret and translate in these relations in, our, in the community for uh, our loved ones to have access to great medical care and legal care uh, and also um, other types of services. Uh, so we're so proud here at Bristol Community College to really t spend some time and give some attention to the Portuguese language and all the countries and cultures that uh, speak Portuguese as well. So Bristol Community College, we uh, started in 1965, so we've been around for a while. I want to welcome you to our Fall River campus and let you know that we actually have four locations. Uh, we have a campus in downtown New Bedford, we have our campus here in Fall River, but we also have a location in Taunton, which is the old Coyle Cassidy uh, High School, and we also have a location in Attleboro. Uh, and we have students uh, who can access these locations uh, within not too far of a drive, and that's very important to our mission uh, to provide an accessible education to all. So thank you for supporting Bristol Community College, our Luso Centro, and I hope that you will really enjoy our very special lecture this evening. Thank you, President Douglas, uh, staunch supporter of everything Luso Centro. We have an exciting event for you this evening, but before we start, some acknowledgments are in order. I would like to thank some people who made this event possible. Our small Luso Centro organizing committee Professors Odette Amarello here, uh, Livia Newbert, who unfortunately could not be here with us this evening, and uh, Maria Ferreira Berdard from Sir Jobs. Thank you for all your <laughs> support in, in, in helping to organize uh, these events. Uh, Tracy Martin at ev event scheduling uh, uh, for reserving the room and the signage that you saw when you came in. 
Arts and Humanities Administrative Assistants, Lisa Noel and Luz Perez. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Kevin Spurlett at Bristol Marketing and Communications, here taking pictures, recording these events, and uh, Keith Thibault and the staff uh, at Bristol Television Services who are also here recording this event for posterity. And also Lourdes da Silva at O Jornal for promoting the event. Of course, a special thanks to our guest speaker, Professor Donaldo uh, Macedo, for accepting our invitation, and all of you who took time off of your busy schedule to join us this evening. I would like to recognize the support and present also of the interim Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Christine Hammond, for all your support of the Luso Center. Dr. Hammond, thank you. <laughs> it was brought also to my attention that we have also a, a representative from Barnstable, I just met him, Representative uh, uh, Dix uh, from Barnstable. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome to Bristol Community College. It was a nice meeting. I know if I start, you all my friends. I know that's why. You, that's why you come to my event. So if I start mentioning, I have to mention everybody's name. So I would be spending uh, the time that you want to listen to the guest speaker speak. So extend my embrace to all of you. This event is sponsored with the generous financial support from the Camões Institute. But last, but certainly not uh, least, my gratitude goes to my co-organizers and sponsors of this event. Inés Nezi Brito, here in front, from the Cape Verdean um, Mother Language Association, Alma CV, which I am also a member, and Angelo Barbosa, Executive Director of the Pedro Pires Institute for Cape Verdean Lang uh, Studies at Bridgewater State University, who I have the honor and pleasure of years of collaborations. As I said earlier, this evening is a very special occasion. This is our International Mother Language Day celebration since it was approved by the UNESCO General Conference in 1999 and observed throughout the world in 2000. It is particularly exceptional for having as a co-organizer a newly created organization that embodies the mission of to, com to commit for the effective linguistic policy that regards the real uh, sociolinguistic situation in Cabo Verde and that is aligned with the main goals of celebrating this particular day. Celebrating these ways of expressing the world in its multi uh, multiplicity, committing to the pres preservation of the diversity of languages as a common heritage, and working for quality education in mother tongues for all. According, this is a quote to the, uh, from the general director of UNESCO. It is also particularly extraordinary for the promoters of the event to have the privilege to host a speaker tonight, one of the most respectable Alma CV's honorary members, Professor Donaldo Macedo, who way before UNESCO's proclamation uh, proclaimed International Mother Language Day our distinguished guest speaker had been for many years 
a trailblazer in the promotion of the Cape Verdean Criollo. Nazi and I are among many of uh, uh, the beneficiaries of his scholarship. Myself, I can remember when I was studying for my doctoral degree at UMass Amherst in the 1990s, he was invited to give a talk about the Cape Verdean language. After the talk, in chatting with him, he encouraged me to also focus on our mother tongue. Today, if I am teaching Cape Verdean language, that is in great part because of his positive influence on me about the importance of studying our mother language. Please now allow me to introduce our guest speaker. Donaldo Macedo is an emeritus professor of English and a distinguished professor of liberal arts and education at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. A critical theorist, linguist, and expert on literacy and education studies, Macedo is the founder and former chair of the Applied Linguistics Masters of Arts program at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Macedo has been a central figure in the field of critical pedagogy for more than 30 years. His work with Paulo Freire broke new theoretical ground as it helped to develop a critical understanding of the ways in which language, power, and culture contribute to the positioning and formation of human experience and learning and learning. Macedo was Freire's chief translator and English language interpreter. His published dialogues with Paulo Freire are considered classic works not only for the elucidation of Freire's theories of literacy, but also for adding a more critical and theoretically advanced dimension to the study of literacy and critical pedagogy. Macedo's and Freire's uh, co-author book, Literacy, Reading the World and the Word, is central to critical literacy in that it redefines the very nature and terrain of literacy and critical pedagogy. This book has been translated in seven languages. In 2003, Macedo was named a member of the laureate chapter of Kappa Delta Phi International Society in Education, one of the world's most prestigious awards in education. Past per uh, recipients of this award include Albert Einstein, Walter Lippmann, Margaret Mead, Charles E. Skinner, and Jean Piaget. The award recognizes Macedo's scholarly contribution over the years and the influence his work has had both in the United States and abroad. Donaldo Macedo was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 2013 in the Republic of Cabo Verde. In 2014, he was elected as a member of the National Academy of Letters also in the Republic of Cabo Verde. Donaldo Macedo has more than 100 publications that include articles, books, and book chapters in areas of linguistics, critical literacy, and multicultural education. His publications include literacy, reading in the world and in the world with Paulo Freire, literacies of power, what Americans are not allowed to know, dancing 
with bigotry with Lilia Bartolomeu, critical education in the new information age with Paulo Freire, Henri Giraud, and Paul Willis, Chomsky on miseducation with Noam Chomsky, Howard Zinn on democratic education with Howard Zinn, and impose democracy dialogues with Noam Chomsky and Paulo Freire. His latest edited book, Decolonizing Foreign Language Education, The Misteaching of English and Other uh, Colonial Languages, was published by Rajkliff. Rutledge, cannot pronounce the word. So please help us welcome Dr. Donald Macedo, who will be speaking about the use of Criollo in our cultural liberation. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. I didn't recognize myself. I uh, <laughs> don't consider myself. Uh, my, for the first time ever, my family is here. My brother, my brother-in-law, my sister, my brother Vinny. I've never spoken. <laughs> They've never heard me speak. They don't know if I do what, what you just said I do. <laughs> because I, at home, I just tease them. <laughs> uh, but I, at any rate, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to talk about something that's very dear to me. And I'll, and I, I'll start by saying uh, how difficult it was to make the decision to study uh, CRIO as part of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and uh, one day I went over my mom's house, and she, she asked me, so, uh, what is that thing? I said, you know, my thesis is going to be on Creole. My first son. You know, <laughs> with all the sacrifice that your dad <laughs> and me made for you to study, and it was huge, I'll mention that in a minute, it was huge, uh, and you're going to study Creole, the language you speak already. <laughs> so in a sense, it shows you the mentality that the type of notion that was inculcated into us as colonized people, that the language, our mother tongue, the language that we celebrated ourselves, that we celebrated our anniversaries, that we played with one another, that we sang, and so on and so forth, was the language that was totally, first was forbidden, I got expelled, when, when I went to high school for being caught speaking Creole <laughs> in the hallway, and uh, uh, I'll mention that, by, by a major, major scholar who also studied Cape Verdean, uh, and he, his, his, his master's dissertation was on Cape Verdean, but you know, it was good to write about it, but not to allow students to speak the very language, and of course, if you don't speak, if you don't practic practice the language, the language will get, uh, get at atrophied, it will be truncated, you know? So I will begin by, first of all, <laughs> you know, my, my, my family may be shocked because my talk is really very political. One of the reasons that I never talk about <laughs> what I do <laughs> in my house, you know, um, but in life, you know, Anybody that claims that something is political, you know, is already being political. <laughs> so there's no such a thing as apolitical existence, you know. Uh, I will begin by quoting, by starting with a quote of a, an incredible Mexican uh, uh, American poet, Gloria Anzaldúa, uh, who had to struggle 
because she spoke text max, which is mixture of English and Spanish. And when she went to Mexico and spoke it, she was discriminated by Spanish speakers from Mexico, as she was discriminated when she spoke it here in the United States by English speakers that tried to say that what she spoke was an aberration <laughs> of bastardization of both Spanish and English. And uh, the argument that I'll be making today, that there's no such a thing as errors or aberration or bastardizations of language, language develop. If we really think about it, you know, the very national language that we celebrate, that we fight for, these are language that at a certain point in their history, I'm talking about Portuguese, Spanish, French, uh, including English, remember that English was not spoken in the court. French was the language of the court. So in a sense then, you know, it's just a matter of time. So right now it's our time to celebrate and we are gonna be speaking Creole and youngsters in Cape Verde will be learning to read in Creole. When I started to read in Portuguese, you know, I didn't speak Portuguese. I understood Portuguese. So I learned to read in a language that was very foreign to me. And if you ask, with all the problems of reading that we have in the United States, if you ask students to read in Japanese or to read in French, you know, not in English. They would be forbidden to read in English, like we were forbidden to read in Creole. You know, the illiteracy rate, you know, will jump hugely. Now, now we'll really have a crisis of literacy because it doesn't make any sense that for you to read in a language that you do not speak, that not only you do not speak, a language that's used as a yardstick against which your humanity is measured. In other, in other words, if you don't speak Portuguese well, you're not intelligent. If you don't speak Portuguese well, you, uh, you, you're not going to go to school, uh, and so on and so forth. In my island, one of the reasons that we immigrated to the United States, you didn't have education past fourth grade. So at 12 years old, I had to go to another island and would stay for nine months without my family, you know, to, in order to access education fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So that was already a problem. Luckily, after the independence, you have education up to uh, high school, even beyond high school in some islands, that the, uh, the, uh, that everybody, it, in other words, education has been democratized. And we lived under dictatorship, you know, colonial dictatorship when uh, I was growing up. So going back to Gloria Anzaldúa, she says, I am my language. Now think about that. If you really believe that I am my language, and if that language is basically, you know, uh, dismissed, derived, that language is basically devalued, it also means that you as a child, you would feel that you are devalued, you're not worth it, you're not intelligent, and we're not, so on and so forth. In fact, in high school, you know, students who spoke Portuguese at home because of their parents, or because they were uh, 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 middle upper class and highly educated families, a handful of them, they had a huge advantage of those who didn't, who were struggling to learn. So then they were considered highly intelligent, not because of the content of what they produce, but because they spoke Portuguese very well. They spoke Portuguese like a native-like individual. You know? It's like, for example, you take a taxi, you know, not in the United States, that doesn't work here, but you go to Portugal, you take a taxi, you know, the taxi driver has fourth grade education, but if from the perspective from a Cape Verdean, because you speak Portuguese, he must be intelligent. He's not, he doesn't have to be intelligent. And in fact, the fact that he's driving a taxi, that meant that he didn't really make it in his own country, you know, to uh, go on 
further to study and so on and so forth. So these are the, basically I'm setting the scenario for what I'm gonna be talking about. So then Gloria, in a very, she was a famous poet, but in one of her, her poems, she said, you know, desengualadas, detongued, like a, your tongue has been yanked out, you know. Uh, Somos los de, del español deficiente. We are those with broken Spanish. We hear this all the time. You speak broken English. Rather than encouraging immigrants to speak English, they're trying to speak English, you know, they speak broken English. Already, there's a, 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 a factor that's unmotivating in, in the process because they are being evo evaluated in the process of speaking. So we have to correct ourselves, but we hear that all the time in a, you know, all kinds of scenario, and, and that has to stop, and this is what Anzaldúa wanted to say. And then she says, hell, yeah. we are your linguistic nightmare, meaning you're gonna have to deal with this. We're not going anywhere. In fact, that is the case, you know. And then she says, y your linguistic aberration, your linguistic mestizaje, mixture, the subject of your burla, the subject of your derision, unquote, by Gloria Anzaldúa, you know. As I attempt today uh, to talk about what I began studying early on uh, in my career many years ago. I have uh, happy to see some of my former students here and they've heard this over, these stories over and over and over again, which means I'm getting old. <laughs> uh, because, and I'm also very happy that some of them, you know, uh, Angel is not my student, uh, uh, Nezi was, for example, but, uh, and, 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 uh, and Carlos and others are teaching, are actually teaching. I was studying it, but I didn't teach. But I did one thing. In 1981, I got a grant from the federal government. I created a, an institute. Uh, and uh, for the first time, we had a course. We, we created the first course created ever, you know, in, before Cape Verde was in the United States at UMass Boston. I proposed a course in Creole that used to be taught by Art, uh, Arthur Lomba. Uh, we taught it for a number of years when we had grants. The grant paid for people to come and study it, you know. And then I had Dul Salmada come for the first time ever to come to the university to talk about Cape Verdean culture, you know. That was in 1981. But it was not easy because 1981, the immigrants were very much against the independence in Cape Verde. I mentioned to, <laughs> to Angelo, sometimes we would have meetings, pro-independence meetings, and, uh, and, and then we'd have counter meetings <laughs> of people demonstrating that we're having a meeting, you know. So it was not an easy time, but I felt, uh, uh, um, I felt, uh, more rebellious every time I would, people would say that we should not be independent. And anybody that would go back to Cape Verde and see the development in Cape Verde, you know, the schools all over the place and uh, 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 the level of uh, sophistication of the society and the culture uh, is just amazing. As you compare, my brother Vinny has gone, uh, he can attest to that, but my mom, God bless her soul, used to take a Cape Verde of 1966 when we left, you know? And uh, there's no such a thing any longer. For example, uh, you have, you know, in my island, that was not the case, you know? Now you have running water in every single home, you know? I mean, that, that's, an, that's a huge achievement in a, in, in, in a very dry nation that water is a real problem, you know? But it, 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 it's happening. So then, in my earlier career, uh, Cape Verdean teachers uh, and linguists were, and I think to some extent they still are cursed, 
Yeah. They are cursed on one hand because they had to deal and we have to deal with the indignities thrown at us by most colonial professional, I don't mean just Portuguese, Cape Verdeans also, prof their arrogance who find that the teaching of Creole is almost sacrilegious. And on the other hand, the same professional who also insist in speaking only in Portuguese, you know, don't say anything. We have an aunt who left to go to Mozambique, she was 20 years old, and insists today that she has forgotten to speak Creole. An impossibility, you know. I remember my dad was really uh, humorous, you know, uh, and there was a dance, and then these traditional dance, you end the dance with this very famous uh, uh, song that was written by our uh, foremost poet, Ogenta Vargas, que es hora de I mean, it's time to leave, you know? And uh, so everybody dances that song, and, uh, and then you sing along as you dance. And my dad and my mom were dancing next to the aunt who shall remain unnamed, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and then she was singing in Creole. And my dad tapped her shoulder, says, well, I thought you forgot to speak Creole. <laughs> 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 you know, so in a sense, we have these contradictions, but contradictions that are very meaningful when you analyze them, it has to do to the way we are, how we have been colonized, we become schizophrenic, <laughs> very schizophrenic in that in certain ways our culture uh, is something that you don't want anybody to criticize it. We want it, we celebrate it. On the other hand, we want to keep it private, not public, because bringing it out publicly, you know, you run the risk of being derided, for example, of the abuse or devalued. You know? so, uh, the colonial, and also not only we feel subordination in speaking Creole, because in, con in certain contexts only, we also felt subordination in speaking the colonial language that we were forced you know, to learn in order to succeed. Because you were constantly measured. Imagine yourself, while speaking, you're constantly being assessed, constantly measured you know, by how well you speak the language, whether you make an error, if you make an error, they correct you, and so on and so forth. Everybody, if you have a couple of drinks, you start speaking English, you're a native speaker, you will <laughs> trip up and make an error. It's normal, but those errors are rule governed. There's a grammar to it. So rather than you know, dismiss the errors or punish students for making an error, study the errors from which then you will understand what really is happening in the process. So a lingua patria, the mother tongue Portuguese, was in a sense uh, 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 inculcated into us to not have it is to basically commit cultural suicide. So then, family like my family, you know, in order to see that we go on to study, and my mom was a major influence in this process, you know, allowed me, I was telling this gentleman that I made one vo voyage in Ernestina that you all know, no motor, you know, by sail, from my, the island where I study, 120 miles away, to the island that I lived, that I went back, you know, after finished nine months of uh, being away from my parents. It took five days to go from one island to the other. But the key was we had to go to Santiago, the major island, and then to Fogo, and then to Brava. But my mom did not know at 12 years old, you know, in five days where I had been whether I was going to arrive or not arrive, no cell phone, no telephone, nothing, zero. 
So in a sense, it was a major sacrifice for parents to let go if they could afford it. You know, and my, in my case, my dad, half a salary was used to send me to the other island so I could study. I'm very grateful for it. And I had this huge pressure to always excel, to make sure that as I'm, I'm the first in the family and Vinny's the last. <laughs> and I, I didn't want it to fail because failing, I would set you know, an example that, uh, that would have not honor the sacrifice that my parents made. So, even those linguists that study the language, like the case that I mentioned before, Baltazar Lopes da Silva was my teacher, a great man, had contributed a great deal uh, towards the Cape Verdean literature, was a founding member of a major, the first movement, a major movement, Claridoso in, in Cape Verde, nevertheless would not allow any of us to speak Creole in class. You know? Or if we would speak Creole with an accent, vestige of an accent from Bravo or from Fogo or from Praia, now Praia is, you know, the, you know, uh, the Creole from Santiago is cool, you know? Uh, but you know, in those days, it was not so cool. In fact, students from Santiago, when they came to San Vicente, you know, to avoid being uh, made fun of, they spoke only Portuguese, you know? <laughs> and so, so, but if he would really detect, you know, a, you know, a trace of an accent because of where you were born, you know, immediately he would make fun of you. You know, I remember he stopped me once from reading. We had this exercise, read aloud. And then he, he said, stop, stop. You know? And then he said, se continuar a falar com este sotaque da brava, you know, <laughs> reprove it. You know? you know, 12 years old, first of all, pedagogically speaking, is terrible. Second, you, you feel inadequate because all you appears, you know, begin to make fun of you, or to I mean, I sympathize with your plight, but it was not something to do. But that shows you that even somebody who contributed a great deal to resist colonialism, you know, would be mentally colonized to the degree that he, while studying and getting a master's degree, you know, and his thesis was on the, the, the dialect of Cape Verde. He never considered it to be a language, you know. But he would not allow it, the language to develop, because if you don't speak it, it's going to be truncated. If you don't write it, you're never going to have an orthography. If you don't use it, you know, it's going to be atrophied. But that's basically what he did. He didn't, I don't blame, at, when I was doing the work, when I was young, I, I, used to, I, used to, I used to resent his attitude. I no longer do that. I've come to learn that he was a man who had been a victim of a particular system of thinking. You know, he, he was mentally colonized as the rest of the country was. In a sense, the end result, you know, high schools, graduates were, were in the dozens, you know, you know in, in, like in the country for a year. Those who have, that went to, on to study in Portugal, there were two or three per year of five. So there's no way, better way to keep the country underdeveloped and a forever colony by not educating the people. We knew that because in the United States, there was a law that forbade the, you know, uh, 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 the education of African Americans. You know, if you were caught, you know, teaching African Americans how to read or write, you know, you could be expelled from school or you could be punished. Yeah, it was a crime to do so. So, in a sense, it was nothing new. It, it colonialism is not, you know, uh, specific to Portugal or to Spain or to or to England and uh, uh, to the United States, the inter what we call here the internal colonialism, 
Yeah? So in many instances then, you know, people defend themselves almost virtually in a self-defense you know, of the internal internalization of inferiority by educated Cape Verdeans is to dismiss the, uh, the right Creole as they reproduce the a neo colonial cult of Portuguese that can be characterized as speaking Portuguese fetish. If you speak Portuguese, we have my own family that people only speak Portuguese. You know? It's almost ridiculous. You know? you, we are telling a story, we're telling a joke, everybody laughs, and then they turn around to their sisters or their brothers and they say, speak Portuguese. Now, in the case, for example, like Bobby, my brother-in-law, who's here, who made you got to be praying for me, so, okay. <laughs> so, uh, he, whether you speak Creole or you speak Portuguese, it doesn't matter. He doesn't speak neither. You know? So, but, you know, it's so, but his presence in the room, you know, would trigger that some of our relatives would be find almost necessary to speak Portuguese as if they are being evaluated, but he doesn't speak Portuguese, you know? <laughs> so let's all continue to speak English, English you, know? you know? And I, 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 the, same, the same relative, I love them to death, but that doesn't, doesn't mean that I cannot deconstruct you know, their behavior, and it's not their fault. They were inculc inculcated to be that way. We were all having a family gathering, the brother, two, my two cousins came in with three American friends, and we're all telling jokes in Cape Verde and laughing. That's what we do. I don't talk literacy or critical pedagogy or Freddy at home. I uh, just be myself. So we all having fun. These three boys come in with my two cousins. All of a sudden, there was a huge silence. And then my cousin starts speaking Portuguese. But I didn't say anything. I caught on to that fact. Then I asked, why did you switch? Then she turned red, because then she caught herself. You see? In other words, you do it automatically, unconsciously. So that's to show you the power of being mentally controlled or mentally colonized to think that you're less that you can only be fully human if you speak the language of the colonizer. Not a small matter. You know, when bilingual education, converted bilingual education started, and I was in the forefront of it, we had to really fight even converted parents. They would come in and say, no, I don't want my child to be taught in Creole. He speaks it, oh, excuse me, he speaks it already. <laughs> well, yeah, of course he speaks it already. But those, those who study English, you know, from elementary all the way to college, because to, for you to go to college, you got to take English composition in Comp 101, Comp 102. It's mandatory. They speak English already, but they continue to study it. Why is it then that we cannot study the language that we speak already? Do you see what I'm saying? That's in the sense the disappointment that my mom had because she thought I was going to write a doctoral dissertation about you know something major or maybe Portuguese, but not not Creole. But Creole, I always felt that I needed to know more about me, and the way to learn that is to study my language. And because I've studied linguistics, because I understood that this devaluation of language all over the world, you know, that now is continuous, but at least now we have organizations that are taking very public positions against it. You know, uh, it's something that uh, it has nothing to do with language or the nature of language or language acquisition. It has to do with the social stereotypes that a society creates that, that has only one thing in mind, to typecast ethically so as to devalue you know, and to dismiss in one's humanity 
in the act of speaking. You know? So I want to say that, the, sadly, the current Portuguese fetish remains in Cape Verde today. Friends of mine who fought for independence, friends of mine who were militants for the independence, some of whom are in power today, they, 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 they speak Portuguese. They speak Portuguese. The institutional life is m mostly Portuguese. You know, and, uh, and I even once asked someone, a friend, I said, why do you continue to insist to speak Portuguese with the laborer you know, who works you know, cleaning, the janitor? And you speak Creole. Why don't you speak to him in Creole? <laughs> Almost automatic. Yeah. E pan mostrar el lugar. E pan mostrar el lugar. Just to put him in his place. So language is used. So in other words, this is a man who fought for independence. So what I'm trying to say is we have gotten political independence. But we have fought from gaining cultural independence. Because so long as your culture continues to provide you with the experience of inferiority, or subordinates you in some level, or that you have to use your culture in your language you know, to show to the other that you're superior to him or to her, already you are colonized. So the decolonization process Amilcar Cabral, our leader, knew this from the very beginning. And he made the following claim. It's not difficult. In fact, it's going to be easy you know, to achieve military victory of the Portuguese army in Guinea-Bissau. Portugal lost in Guinea-Bissau, not in Angola, not in Mozambique. It was in Guinea-Bissau. But it's going to be extremely difficult, you know, to basically get rid of the colonial mind which has been inculcated into us for five centuries, you know. And this is be the struggle that I think I may be wrong that in teacher preparation, in 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 policies that are being made, even though the policies you know, acknowledge Cape Verdean as a language, but we don't teach it. We don't teach, well, you don't teach it and then you, you hear things. We don't teach it because you have all these varieties. <laughs> it's almost silly argument because, you know, if you go to the South, then you shouldn't be teaching English because I don't understand what they're talking about. <laughs> you know, it's a variety, right? So the variety is totally different. So varieties you have all over the place. In the Portuguese context, then the Azorean Portuguese should not be taught at all, ever, because you can't even understand you know, an Azorean and when they talk to you, you know, because that's what they know. Nevertheless, the written form, everybody reads, whether you're from St. Michael's or whether you're from you know, South Texas, you know, when you're reading, you know, that particular orthography, you're able to read. The, the, book, ha, the book has no accent. The accent is a social invention, a social creation. It's something that we all have. It's part of who we are. It's the culture where you're raised. The baby learns, you know, that language. You know, it's like learning the music. You hear, we hear Cape Verde music, we begin to dance. Do you see? And uh, Americans, you know, listen to rock and roll, and now, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, in Cape Verde, Funana, <laughs> talk about Funana, you remember, you know, it's, it's a dance that's very sexualized, and, uh, and, and during the colonial times, was against the law. You couldn't come to the city dance with those dancers. You know, uh, you couldn't come to the plateau. You know, and everything had to be done. You know, outside. Mama 
would watch on television, you know, you know these, these or people would tell her. Or she would go to the, see people dancing, you sort of like, you know, hugging each other very closely. One day I was going to a party, she goes, Nya fichun de pedibum favor. <laughs> My son, I'm going to ask you a big favor. Please don't dance. To her, that was incredibly indecent, you know. In that, in Cape Verde, it's totally normal, you see. So in a sense, these are things that you learn. But when we immigrate, we tend to freeze time. So she did not accompany the evolution of Cape Verde. So in a sense, she was using measures of the 1960s, you know, to try to, you know, make value, value, value judgment about what's really happening in dancing or in music, you know, in post-independence, you know. So against then this cultural dependency that is spreading like prairie fire in Cape Verde, more and more, every visit that I make, I will see, particularly in Santiago, this more tendency to rely on Portuguese, you know, even in social event, than you, than, for example, when I was growing up in Cape Verde, you see? So in a sense, uh, the independence, you know, uh, I think policy makes need to understand there's no way in hell that we're going to be culturally liberated while, you know, dismissing, devaluing the very, the very huge part of culture, which is language. Think about, you know, the American culture without the American English. It wouldn't happen. You know, you cannot, you know, you cannot, you cannot really separate those things. But that's what's really happening, you know, that then we then use, we allow, uh, and we not allow, we, we look forward to use the Cape Verdean language in the expression, you know, no, have fun in music, in parties, you know, in telling jokes with one another. You know, try to tell a joke, try to tell a joke, you know, you know, any, I don't care how well you speak Portuguese, uh, try to tell, I don't care how well you speak English, try to tell a Cape Verdean joke, you know, in this language that you master so well. No, it won't happen. Do you see what I'm saying? By the same token, I remember I was invited by uh, uh, Carlos Vega uh, many years ago. He was culture, Minister of Culture to give a lecture. Well, well received in, in, in Asomada. There were over a thousand people there. But in San Vicente, I'm sorry, but they think we are more European in San Vicente, you know, there was a resistance to what I was proposing. What I was proposing is very basic, we had been doing it in the United States for many years, is bilingual education, Cape Verdean English. You have bilingual education, Cape Verde, Cape Verdean Portuguese. But even that, the, the proposal that basically was a non-proposal, was a, you know, a, a, a fact of life for students that came from, uh, from, from Santo Antão, came from Brava, not speaking Portuguese, not never studying Portuguese, so it wouldn't make sense to teach them Portuguese here, which they have no contact with Portuguese, then we would have transitioned them from Cape Verde into English. You know, so there was no resistance to speak of, you see? But there was a lot of resistance in San Vicente when I made the proposal. So this man, who only spoke Portuguese, God bless his soul, he is dead, and, uh, and got up, and he didn't ask me a question. He went on, he gave another lecture. <laughs> and the other lecture saying, how can you really make the proposal since the language, Cape Verdean language, has no grammar? Well, come on. If it doesn't have a grammar, how can you really explain that for 500 years it's been passing on generation upon generation and people learning it? It's, you know, you have our most beautiful poetry is written in Cape Verdean, you know. A major poet, you know, is uh, Eugen Tavares, you know. He wrote his best poetry, in my view, is the ones written in Creole, you know. He wrote very well in Portuguese, but it was not the same Eugen Tavares, you know. Then I, basically when I, you couldn't stop him. He was furious. 
he, he was upset that I would have the, you know, the gall to even suggest that. And then he went on and on, and when he stopped, and I said, well, how am I gonna do this? I said, I said it's, let, me, let me put it this way. If Cesaria Evora, a major singer, were to sing in Portuguese, would she be as famous as she is today all over the world, representing the country? And he had to say no. You know? Then I said, even Luda, who was born Cape Verdean, born in Portugal, Portuguese dominant, you see, learned Cape Verdean later on to sing. If Luda would sing in Portuguese, would, be, would she be as famous as she was at that time? You know, and he said, no. I said, well, then I rest my case. You see, in other words, it's very difficult, you know, for you to deny that language is the essence of who we are in the process of creating. Music is creativity. So we need that language to create. So when you take that language away from youngsters early on, because they have to learn in the colonizer's language, what you're doing, you're obstructing in a direct way, you know, creativity that should be, you know, unleashed rather than truncated, you know, and that's basically, you know, the situation. But the situation for me is that we went through it and they say, well, you got educated, you made it, yeah, but I am an exception to the rule. You know, many of my friends, the friends with whom I played football, the friends that you know, I, uh, I grew up with, did not make it, did not study. They did not study because they were less intelligent than I was, no. They did not study because they couldn't afford, or they didn't study because they didn't have access to Portuguese in the way that our family had, you see? So there was material condition that constrained their development, and by not developing, of course, they did not appear to be as intelligent, you know? But then when I went, went back, after 23 years, and I saw, with schooling all over the place, people that normally grew up with me, there's no way in hell there would be engineers, there would be doctors, there would be lawyers, and there were doctors, engineers, because they were studying all over the world, you know? The United States, including Portugal, Cuba, you know, Brazil particularly, they were studying. So in a sense then, we can, if you control education uh, via language policy, basically you retard the development of a people. You know, the people's creativity and so on and so forth. So it's bad enough that Portuguese colonialism did that. You know, that's what they were supposed to do. They were colonizers, you know, but it's, much worse when we are doing it to ourselves. It's much worse when we still have that here we have bilingual programs, English and Cape Verdean, and succeeding. There are so many students that have gone, in the, Nazi is a case in point, he was a teacher of many of them, that graduated, went to college, you know, uh, are now professional, are teachers themselves, are doctors, and so on and so forth, <laughs> through that program, and my friends in Cape Verde still hesitant, you know, talking about we don't have books written in Creoles, we don't have an orthography, which would, you know, uh, uh, on which variety you're going to really, you know, systematize the orthography. Well, if you read, you know, Shakespeare, you know, and during that time there were multiple <laughs> competing orthography. People wrote more or less the way they, they spoke, or they, they created. Uh, there was not, certainly not the standardized orthography. That meant then you, Shakespeare would never be published because you have to have an orthography standardized before you can publish. No, it doesn't work that way, you know, we all know that. 
but trying to convince a colonized mind that that's not the case, it's not easy. And we've been at it for 50 years. We've been independent for 50 years, and it hasn't, it hasn't happened. So then this outsized celebration of the colonial language alongside you know, the language spoken by 100% of the population, you see, uh, you know, truncates devel development, at least educational development in some real way. So then, I want to say, as noted by my late friend, uh, Paulo Freire, I quote, in spite of high level of interest and motivation of those beginning literacy, it is impossible to learn a foreign language as if it were a national language. As, virtu as, as a virtually unknown language, during the centuries of colonial pressure, the people fought to preserve their cultural identity through Creole. In fact, Creole was the language that we resisted colonialism. Creole is the language that we defied colonialism. Creole is the language that gave rise to Funana, to Batanka, to uh, uh, Tabanka, and so on and so forth. So this is the language of power. Unleash it, let people speak, let students use it, let's teach it. And the contrary happens. You know, you know better than I do because you're, you were part of that system, but you don't agree with the system, I know. You know. So, to, I contend then that the current language policy in education Cape Verde is ideological and it can be only understood by the emergence of a counter discourse or counter discourses which can interrogate the continued hegemony of Portuguese as the hegemony of English that answer your question. We have all these languages that come, we all have relatives that speak, we all go to parties to hear these languages, but one generation, two generations, and three generations it disappears because of the hegemony of English. But there's a real price to be paid. Whereas you go to Europe, any high school graduate speaks two, three, four languages, you know, we have great scientists, you know, MIT and Harvard trained, you know, and they are tongue-tied in English. What I mean by that, even speaking English, they're speaking you know, in the highly specialized, you know, professional that they study, and, uh, and they communicate in, in that circle, and they couldn't care less about having the curiosity to know the other, because when you learn a language, you are open up frontiers and borders, you know, to access cultures that probably before you didn't. My best education, I happen, to go study one summer in Spain, and that's what really motivated me to want to continue and to do what I do today, you know? So in a sense, but if I had not learned Spanish, that would not have happened. If that, not had, if that did not happen, I could very well be, and I would be okay with it. You know, I was a mechanic for my uncle, <laughs> who paid me minimum wage, <laughs> but I had no other choice, you know? You had to live, make a living. So I had no problem with that, but what I'm saying is language is what really made me who I am today, and the fact that having lived in three different continents, in Cape Verde, Africa, in the United States I learned English, and, 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 and in Spain I learned Spanish, you know, it made me a, a world citizen rather than you know, this very uh, 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 monolingual, person who may be very smart, you know, in other ways, but cannot communicate, you know, that smartness. And worse is when you begin to think that English is the language. So everybody has to speak English, you know. Uh, and I, 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 I give, been lucky enough to give lots of conferences in many different countries. I go with American colleagues, and they all begin, I am sorry, uh, I can't speak all languages. Bon dia, and then they say, I'm sorry, that's all I can say. You know, uh, 
you shouldn't be sorry. You should be ashamed. <laughs> you know, you know. But, but, but uh, that, the, that's the issue. Let me, let me just finish by, by saying to you that uh, even Creole, uh, when I, I was eight, I was lucky, very, I've been very fortunate. I did my postdoctoral work with Noam Chomsky, and he, at that time he was studying this theory, uh, what he calls universal language, and then immediately I saw, I began to understand Cape Verdean. For example, I'm using this example in English, so you know it would be easy for us to understand one another. Uh, and uh, 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 what do you call someone before I do that? What do you call someone who speaks multiple language? And what do you call someone that speaks only one language? American. American. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, uh, so in a sense, you know, uh, basically he was trying to show that, for example, I have four examples. The number one, yesterday me no go movie. You have those, those of us who really teach foreign, uh, far, foreign students, uh, in, uh, people, those of us who are foreign ourselves, me no go movies, you know, we think it's an error. You know, it's not an error, you know. Uh, children acquiring their mother tongue, English, you know, they make this type of so-called errors. The second one, yesterday, Mary, no goat movie, where they learn that the, 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 uh, the, uh, the mechanical uh, ED, tense, past tense marker, uh, you know, it also function as a, ten, a past tense marker. What they do then, they apply it to the irregular verb, go, and becomes goat. So it's, it's a rule across the board that our children, you, your babies, or your grandchildren, you know, you pay attention, they do the same thing, you know? And uh, then the third one is, yesterday Jane no went movie, since to go, you know, is highly irregular in English, so he has an irregular past tense. So when they first said go, you know, uh, no go, go, no, no when, you know, movie yesterday. Yesterday, Jane and Mary no wented movie where they use went and then they learn that the, the ED function as a marker and then they, they collapse it, you know, they join it together to do that. So children, as adults, as all of us learning another language, we are creatively trying to figure out, you know, as we learn. So rather than dismissing these errors, you know, uh, we should just applaud. So one of the reasons that Portuguese, or oh, this man, for example, gave you, told me, Cape Verdean language has no grammar. How the hell can you say we're going to teach it? You know, well, he is basing on the facts. Portuguese is highly has a highly inflected verbal system. Eu amo, tu amas, ele ama, amamos, amais, amam. You know, with Cape Verdean, we're much smarter. You know, we said, why waste all of that time and effort? We just collapse everything into one form. Ama, 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 ama. You know. But in creating that rule that we do away with the inflections, we superimpose another rule that the personal pronoun must be present always. So do you see? So the, the, these are the, the things that I think that we should, as Cape Verdeans, our linguists and teacher and teacher training, rather than allowing you know, this folk theory to continue, because it's nothing but folklore to continue, that it has no grammar, to try to be try to analyze, which is really happening more and more and more, you know, people are studying Cape Verdean language, not only Cape Verdean linguists and teachers, but also people from the outside. There are a lot of doctoral dissertation people that didn't speak Cape Verdean, but go to Cape Verde or learn Cape Verde in order to do so. So when Chomsky was talking about this theory, the universal grammar, you know, tendency, you know to basically always, no matter what, you go towards the base form, and that base form 
is unmarked. So markedness is something that's part not of the core grammar, but what's called, he calls periphery. You know, so in periphery, then you have language that are extremely, you know, uh, we call elaborated. Uh, already the term that we use, elaborated, must be good, you know. <laughs> elaborated, you know, uh, then it must be more difficult. It must be, be the language of civilization. But listen, for the child learning that so-called difficult elaborated language, you know, it's like a cup of tea, you know. It's no difficulty. That child learns that language with the same ease that we learn Creole or you learn English. So, so in a sense, these notions of superiority of language difficulty is the faculty for those of us who do not know. You know? But one thing is for certain. If you all go to Japan and you don't speak Japanese and you do not speak English, you are not in a tourist track route. And then you try, you try to communicate. You invariably will develop what's called pigeon. We have pigeon English. Our language is a pigeon that became Creole, and so on and so forth. But how do you know what to pigeonize? In other words, you know nothing about Japanese. The Japanese know nothing about you, but invariably, you end up doing precisely what children do and what Creole speakers do and pidgin speakers all over them. They all go to the unmarked form. So that is that an internal grammar that we have, according to Noam Chomsky, that internal grammar cannot be less of a grammar of a grammar that's prescri prescriptive. And now you prescribe it, you write it, you write rules. You know, you know, the fact that I said I don't want to go, I don't I no I don't I I I don't I don't have no money, you know, is an error. It's an error only until the any got invented. And it was not part of the English history, you know, always. Do you see what I'm saying? So there was a, 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 an invention that got created that the same way with Portuguese and authors and teachers, and that's what we do for a living. We get paid to invent. We get pay, paid to correct. We get paid to do what is very unnatural. The natural thing is to allow students to be creative in the language that they master, in the language that they speak with much ease. So I just want to have one, uh, 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 some recommendation, and I'll finish with that, is that, you know, teachers, particularly whether in Cape Verde or here anywhere else, you know, whose specialization is linguistics, should first, you know, before they study linguistics, the rules that govern the realization of that language, they should have, you know, what, what, I, what I would want to call the ethics of linguistics, you know. What, it, what is it, you know, that, what is it that's going to happen with your rules, you know? Is your rules going to really, you know, celebrate a child, or is your rules going to make the child feel that she's dumb, you know, she is no reader? Like at one time in Utah, in this Indian reservation at Ford Foundation Grant, you know, we went with the English professors of the, uh, the, the University uh, 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 of Utah, and we came back in the de debriefing, an English teacher says, for 25 years, you know, I've been working with Indian, with the Indian reservation, you know, you know, it ain't gonna happen, it's not gonna happen. I've never passed. The, not that I've never passed an Indian in my in my, my English composition, you know. And I turned around and said, Are you proud of that? <laughs> you, know, you know, the minute I asked that question, she she cut herself. And now she was proud that she used, you know, the rules that did not they spoke the native language, Navajo, and then they also spoke English, but the English they spoke quote unquote, they were broken English. 
because they were broken English, then she's not going to pass any of them. So therefore, they drop out. You know? So you, you can't be proud of that. Those of us who are engaged in pedagogy, you want to be able to celebrate and to create conditions where someone is, 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 uh, is, is, is allowed to feel fully human, not less human, because you know, it, he or she, at that particular moment of history and development uh, of his or her history, you know, does not happen to have uh, mastered the standard language that's spoken by the middle class or upper middle class in, by and large. So I, I want to say then that teachers need to go beyond you know, crass careerism and look at their job only as teaching literacy and then give them exams and fail someone because nobody learns at the same rate at the same time. So they are, uh, particularly with foreign students and uh, particularly with people like ourselves in learning to, to learn, uh, uh, to read in Portuguese, the language that we did not master, you know, it was unfair to have a timeline that expect us to perform the same way, at the same rate that someone spoke, who spoke Portuguese as a native language at that particular moment, you know. Uh, then it seems to me that in, 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 in preparing teachers, we need to prepare teachers who are multiculturalists, you know. They are open to the world of various languages, various cultures, and then to go beyond the folkloric anthropological approach uh, to contrast cross-cultural analysis that what this, like, this culture has, X, this other culture has, Y, and so on and so forth. You now, culture and language are very messy. You know, there's an admixture that happens all the time. You know, to talk about purity and then to isolate, we're not in a laboratory. It's, it's impossible to look at teaching as if you're really, you know, splitting atoms or, you know, or, 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 or dissecting, you know, uh, cells in the biology uh, uh, laboratory, you know. So then, last educators in Cape Verde, in particular since this lecture about this, if we are going to think seriously about cultural liberation, we have to begin to liberate, you know, and unchain the very language that basically historically for five centuries uh, were forbidden to be, you know. In other words, we cannot continue to ask youngsters that in order for them to be, they have to stop being. Meaning, in order for them to be educated, they have to stop being Cape Verdean and be something else like a Portuguese. You know, to me, that's silly. Uh, it, it's contra contradictory, and and it's unethical. You know, to, to boot. Uh, so, let me end by, and then we can discuss. And are you praying for me, Bob? Well, okay. Uh, the uh, the uh, by by ending with. Glory Anzaldur, that uh, uh, the imposed imperial colonial hacking or yanking uh, of non white tongues, you know, in the name of same in the name of saving civilization, to me is a bad joke that no one wants to be at the end of that stick, you know. Uh, there's no civilizing act when you're taking a child's language away. There's no civilizing act in the process of not allowing a child to be, you know, her full self, you know, if she wants to be, you know. And language is, she cries in that language, you know. She dreams in that language, you know. You know, it, it, she, like I said before, we, try to tell a nice Cape Verdean joke in English that we speak, or the Portuguese that we speak, and it ain't gonna happen. Or it's not gonna be as funny. Or we're not going to really connect with it. Because language is more ju than just mere grammar and structure. It, it has an emotional connection to us. It's who we are. This going back to Gloria Anzaldua. I am my language. 
So in a sense, when I'm with my friends, with my family, we're talking, we're talking in Creole, you know, I, 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 I have a different experience. I'm not saying a superior or worse experience. I have a different experience that's very intimate, you know. I speak English, I do most of my writing in English, you know, I train thousands of English teachers, but I don't have a love affair, I don't have intimacy. It's a language that is a third language to me, you know. It's not a language that I was born with. Even though I left Cape Verde as a youngster, you know, I hear that language, you know, you, you, could, you, you, you feel a romance with it, you know. And I'm sure you do that with English, you just are not conscious of it. You know, the reason you're not conscious of it, no, you've never been in a position that somebody stopped you from speaking it, you see. So the minute you run the risk of losing it, then you become more romantic, you know, you appreciate what you have. You don't know what you have until you lose it, you know. So, as Anzal do it, and I'll end with this note, because we speak with tongues of fire, defiance, we are culturally crucified. What she mean by that is that if those students who resist and continue to speak text max in class, teachers one way or the other find ways to crucify them, meaning give them bad grades, uh, uh, or find ways in a way that they cannot. They, they're not a good fit. That, that expression is often used. Again. Racially, culturally, and linguistically, somos huérfanos. We are or orphans. We speak an orf orphan tongue, unquote. After over half a century of political independence, in our case, yeah, it is hard, high time that we shift from speaking an orphan lang language or tongue, you know, and shift from that paradigm and reclaim our Creole as a language of defiance, as a language of power, as a language of love, because we know that our best poetry, our best songs, are not written in Portuguese or English or French, they written in Creole. We all love it to death, we dance to it. Even in funerals, we accompany our uh, loved ones who leave us, you know, with this language of love. So, then I ask you, some of you don't speak it, but I will translate it for you. Try to capture the depth, the breadth, and the intensity in Portuguese in the following Marna poet, as a song poem. Partida, ora triste de tormento, chão de chora em amágua, deitado na ragaz de calcriola, minha coração pulsa na peto. El cre fica, mas el tem que ir. Na doçura de meu olhar sedutor, na calor de vos afetos, na paz de vos ódios madornados, no translation, okay. um pó fé na torna volta, unquote. All the key versions here are touched by it. You see what I'm saying? But in a sense is, but if I translate it for you, you only get you know, a small taste of it, but you will never get the depth, the breadth, and the intensity and the power, you know, uh, that these verses, you know, uh, uh, capture for the Cavian speaker. Thanks for listening to me. Obrigado. Thank you. I, I, I know that we could be here much longer listening to Professor Macedo. I just uh, wanted to uh, recognize someone um, also um, that 
uh, our general counsel uh, in Boston, uh, Dr. <laughs> Otavio Gomes, is here with us. <laughs> Welcome to Bristol. I hope this is not the first, it is first of many of your visits there, okay? Uh, I think we're gonna have a few minutes. I was planning to have, I know it's past the time, but we, with this lecture, I know we have comments and discussions from the audience, so I'm gonna open up for a few comments or questions. Uh, so, um, Jim. It's invisible to the extent that you know you don't have any books written in it, and there are teachers that discourage you from speaking it in class. My teacher certainly, actually, he threw me out of the class. You know that doesn't happen anymore. Like, well, that's, that's what my question is. Currently, what is the no? Currently, the currently, it's sort of a, <laughs> a, a bad marriage. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, you can't wait to get out. You know. But uh, you know, what currently is, we know intellectually, or even emotionally, that it is our language. But we keep delaying and delaying, waiting for studies to be done before we practice it. Well, in the United States, because we don't have a relationship with the colonial US, we have a very you know, stormy relationship with colonial Port Portugal, you know. So what happens then, here, nobody, I can't even speak in English, nobody is, you're speaking English, nobody is evaluating your English, you know. But if you speak Portuguese, you, be you better believe, you know. I even have dear friends, you know, uh, uh, dear friends who, uh, for whatever, and they do it not because they are snobs or arrogant, they do it to protect their own children by speaking Portuguese only at home. And, uh, and then they would make remarks to me something like this, you know. Uh, I sent someone over, I met some, a woman that I met in Idaho, of all places. Uh, she's from Saint Antoine. And uh, so she went to San Vicente. So I wanted some friends to, to meet her. And, uh, and she's going to spend the day before going to Saint Antoine. And one of the comments was made, uh, uh, she speaks Portuguese very well. So hell, <laughs> you didn't say she speaks Creole very well. You know, you, if you spoke English, you, you would never say she spoke English very well. But in other words, they, their comment was made is they wanted to celebrate her, but their celebration of her was demeaning. You see, in other words, why are you so surprised that she speaks Portuguese very, very well, even though she's been living in Idaho for all these years, you know? You know, uh, nothing was said about she speaks Creole very well, you know, and she had been here for a number of years. You know, about four or five years ago, there was a bad storm, you know, uh, uh, in, in, in Cape Verde, and it really affected some of you said there never rains, lots of rain came, a lot of poor people lost their homes and so on and so forth. You could see the reporter who's Portuguese, excuse me, who's Cape Verdean, but speaks Portuguese because the minute you know you have a mic in front of you, automatically you you switch to Portuguese. It's like, for example, even Cape Verdeans here, friends, you know, if you if somebody calls immediately, you answer in Portuguese. You're Cape Verdean. You know, and the person may be English, but it's almost instantaneous. It's it's uh, it's it's automatic. It's it's uh, it's it's etch in your consciousness that a phone, a, a, a microphone, you know, signals that you must perform, you know, in the language of the colonizer. What I'm trying to say is, we have to we have to basically squeeze that inferiority out of us, you know and see it as normal, you know? But I remember in the episodes that they would go to these communities that were devastated, lost their homes, lost everything, and then the reporters who speak very, very well, in fact, some of them would speak 
Cape Ver uh, Portuguese correctly as reporters, you know, but you could see it, it is a second language to them. The ease, you know, is not there. They insist to do the interview to speakers, you know, in the interior of the island who don't have much contact with Portuguese, don't speak Portuguese. They try to talk about the human suffering, what they have lost in Creole, and the reporter insists in speaking in Portuguese, and then he, they're trying to repeat the same thing, and she insists. At certain point, she gave up and she started speaking Creole. I said, hell, why didn't you begin with Creole to begin with? <laughs> Do you see? So that's what I'm trying to, to say. It's not only a linguistic issue, it's a psychological issue that certain positions demand, as part of being a member of the society, that you speak in, in Portuguese. No, because you give me that opportunity. I have nothing against Portuguese. I'm very fortunate that I learned it. And I think everybody in, in Cape Verde should learn Portuguese. But what we need to learn Portuguese as a foreign language, as we do French, not as a native language, and as it is, the schools still take you know, Portuguese. It is taught with strategies and tactics of a native language. Well, it's not native language to the vast majority of Cape Verdeans who go to school. They learn Portuguese in school. So it's just to switch the paradigm. Yes, celebrate Portuguese, you should. And also the other argument that I think is silly, that Portuguese is an international language, therefore, you know, well, you go to the United Nations, you know, Portuguese who speaks in Portuguese gets translated into English. You know, you know that translation is done. You know, so you go, you, know, <laughs> you go to 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 the United Nations. You you give your speech in Creole. Then they have to find an interpreter. They will do the same thing. For the American, they don't know any different. But for the German, who don't know ne neither Portuguese nor not not Creole, do not know any different. But we have to sacrifice our language so as to appear that we are somebody through somebody else's language. You know? mm -hmm. To me, it's a borrowed language. It's a language that's very fundamental to us. It is, in a sense, a gift to the society, even though it didn't play that role for centuries. You know, it was, was, was a, a, a pun punishing tool, you know, by and large. But I think that, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy, for example, I had this discussion with Peter Peters many, many times, you know? yeah, and one time he asked me if he was gonna give this major speech, and then he said, excuse me, some kind of Creole or Portuguese? No, Portuguese, no, Creole. The thing, he was so lucky because the room, it was in Sheraton, Boston, the room was, Filled with Cape Verdean Americans born here, like yourself, you know, born here, understood Creole, but had no relationship, no connection with Portuguese, you know. And then he gave a brilliant speech, you know, and then I went to the men's room right after that. Five of these guys, they're from the Cape, you know, way now, you know, they're talking at the in that den. In that den. Can come back in the Portuguese. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't need too. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's right. Lucky that he didn't speak in Portuguese. I understood everything. Mm -hmm. They went there to hear him. Mm -hmm. You see? So the, his, you know, so what could Pedro Pires have gained from speaking in Portuguese? You know? Mm -hmm. So that back in Cape Verde there would, you know, show, you know, his you know, him speaking in Portuguese? No. You know, he spoke in the language that his people here speak. Mm -hmm. Here we speak Creole and English. Mm -hmm. You know, since he ain't gonna be speaking in English, so speak Creole. And he did with much ease, mm -hmm. and he was eloquent. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. was eloquent in speaking. Gunga was there yeah. facilitating this cultural attaché that we have. Uh, was, 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 it, was a very normal, I, in fact, it, I, I hope it was state, I like to have it for instruction purpose, mm -hmm. you know, shows that if Pedro Pires, you know, speaks with much ease, it doesn't make any big deal out of it, you know, 
then the fee subordinates will also do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But so long the leaders continue to insist in Portuguese mm -hmm. and Portuguese only, or to, to, uh, 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 to boast, look how great I am. I speak Portuguese, mm -hmm. like some Baltazar used to tell us in class, you know, eu domino, falo melhor, falo português melhor que os próprios portugueses. Because mm -hmm. he's boasting, I, 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 I master and I speak Portuguese better than Portuguese themselves. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I want you to be a good teacher. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there, this uh, uh, he reminded me uh, back uh, in 2008, there was a group of us that spent a week in Cape Verde uh, discussing. Uh, the, the Cape Verdean language, the alphabet, and all. So we had a meeting uh, with the, uh, the Minister of Education in her office. So we, we are discussing, you know, the implementation of Creole, and when we sat in her office, she said, I know Juan uh, uh, he was there as well, and, and, and and she said, you know, I feel more comfortable speaking in Portuguese. We said, no, no, no. You are in your office, but we are discussing Creole. Please, you speak Creole, you're gonna speak Creole with us. <laughs> we forced her to speak Creole. Don't feel ashamed to speak your language. So we, we told, and she, she switched, she switched to, to Creole. So, yeah. You see this. Thank you. I, I remember mm -hmm. when we first got independence, I think it was 1976 or 77, I was a professor at BU, Boston University. And uh, the <coughs> director, he was not the Minister of Education, but he had a high position. You know, uh, he was the director of uh, curriculum or something like that. So we had a group, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of bilingual teachers some who were, who were born in this country did not speak Portuguese. And then we were discussing, and so I was probing, I was asking him some of these questions that we basically share tonight, you know? And he was getting uncomfortable. And at a certain moment, he switched to Portuguese. He switched to Portuguese, I let him go for about two minutes, then I, I said, excuse me? Hello? <laughs> you troca. I came here, I was a youngster. I've done all my study in English. I live in the United States. And I'm forced to study and I'm going to study in English. I'm going to study in Portuguese. You see, it's to show you, it's to show you how nonsensical, you know, Forza Dagu is a cover for the subordination that you feel that you don't feel professional enough in Creole. But you feel it's the quality of the work that you do, how you are with the people, the competence that you have in your area of specialization that matters, not the language that you be basically represent yourself as speaking at a particular moment. You know? But it was in Vivo, stay mad. Okay, I think one more comment or question. Any? Oh, Mike, Mike. Uh, this is a this is this is a really funny funny story. And to uh, corroborate my story, Joao Rosa will corroborate. Uh, Rich Gorda had a long history with uh, with with Cape Verde. Uh, uh, Jose Maria asked us to start the first Cape Verde University, so we helped him in that regard. A lot of work was done all over. And we thank you for that. Well, that's okay, but <laughs> no, 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 we do. That's not the story. <laughs> but the story was we were invited to go to the inauguration, so we sent the delegation from Bridgewater to go to the inauguration. Well, at the time, the only second Cape Verdean president in the United States, okay, there's 3,200 universities and colleges in the United States. Second Cape Verdean, the only one. So Dana was given the opportunity to speak at the inauguration. So he 
shows me the speech, uh, and I go, he's, he's the, what do you think, Mike? I said, sounds good. He said, but, you know, I can't, I can't speak Creole. I said, and I can't speak Corpus. I said, who do you tell? I didn't go there. He said, well, who are we going to get to do it? I said, I know who we'll get to do it. He says, who? I said, we have Dr. Joao Rosa with us. He was born in Cape Verde. I think he's got an earned doctorate, okay? I know he speaks Creole and other languages. We'll let him do it. He says, fine. I bring it to Joao. Joao goes, okay, Mike. What do you want me to do with it? I said, what do you mean, what do I want you to do with it? I said, we're in Cape Verde. It's the first university, UNICD, University of Cape Verde, not the University of Lisbon. <laughs> Where would I am? I said, do it in Creole. Jonathan went, you sure? <laughs> I said, absolutely. He says, good. Because if you're a rebel, he's a greater rebel. <laughs> so we went. Everybody was there. They were from Canary Islands. They were from all these universities. Because they were celebrating in a loose home kind of way. Because now they want to bring them into the fold. Everybody gave their speeches. Okay? All in. Portuguese. It was time for Dana to do it. As soon as he said the first three sentences, Jotun did it in Creole. You could have bought the room for a penny. <coughs> All the Creoles went like this. Everybody who came heard, they were like this. Everybody who was from the Lucy phone went like, it was almost how dare they? How dare they? On a, an event such as this, that's supposed to be a high water mark in education, do do it in a language that is not supposedly written or anything. How dare they do it? Okay, but the comments after it was done were just remarkable. From all of the Cape Verdeans who were there, they said, "I can't believe that that was done. It had never been done. No, so never been done because it was almost." It almost was like we were, we were, it was a message that we wanted to send, okay? It is a Cape Verde, it's the first public Cape Verde yeah. university. So therefore, Creole is important. Yeah, I thank you very much for this story. Juan had to share that with me when he came back. And, uh, but I don't even think it's about being rebellious. And it, it, I have this good friend, a great African-American feminist, that, God rest her soul, died a few years ago, two years ago, Bell Hooks. He said, at a certain moment, you need to transgress. Right. Yeah, you need to transgress. Teaching is about transgressing. That's when, when the Portuguese went like this, and the Cape Version went like this, you shut the hell out of everybody, mm -hmm. you see? Because the expectation is that in, the, in higher education, Creole has no room whatsoever, you see? And then you're going to continue to reproduce the colonial, the neo-colonial mentality. You know, it is these moments that I think, if, if this is what I call the ethics, ethics in linguistics, that you take these stories, these moments, and then you analyze them. Why is it that people reacted? They reacted because they were not expecting it. What they were expecting it? They expected the status quo to continue. But we didn't, I don't think that Amilcar Cabral and all the people who lost their lives fighting for independence to give us the, uh, the, uh, the honor that we now have today to say that we have a country, we are independent, that we, could, we, we undermine that, that struggle by reproducing elements of colonialism that basically continually devalue us in every word that we take out of our mouth if we do it in Creole, you know. So with that, I'm exhausted. Yeah.